Turn your Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, I'll try to remember how to turn this thing on. I got it, Jerry? Good. I guess I was born uh, 20 years too late. Electronics kind of leave me cold, you know, but, uh, but anyway. Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 14. This is the passage. This is actually right after Jesus came down. Um, got back from being tempted by the devil. Um, and verse 13 says, and when the, devil had, when, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. You know, it's interesting that after he after he resisted the temptation of the devil, he was filled with the Spirit. And sometimes when we're tempted and we give in to it, we forget that if we had resisted the temptation, then we'd have some power of God. And um, that's not the message, but it's, it's just an observation. It's just an observation. Uh, starting with verse, 14, verse 15, he taught in the synagogue. Verse 16 is where our passage begins. And he came to Nazareth, where he had, brought, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. On the Sabbath day, he, and to stop here again, you know, Jesus is our perfect example. Jesus, as his custom was, went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He found it important to worship because that's what Jews did. Jews went to the synagogue. Uh, the Bible says, in, um, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus could have said, the synagogues are corrupt, which they were. The Pharisees and Sadducees are corrupt, which they were. He could have said, they can't teach me anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> because he is the word of God, and uh, they couldn't really teach him anything, but that wasn't his attitude. But that's not the message either. Uh, verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed, and he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings, God. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for uh, giving us a Bible that we can trust. God, for giving us the truth. God, our, wor our world is full of lies. God, we, we don't know what to believe so many times, but we know every time we open this book, that we can believe every word of it. And God, we're so thankful for that. We're so thankful for absolute truth that comes from the scripture. And God, I pray that you'd be with this message this morning, God. Please, please help folks, God, to see you. Help them not to see me. And God, I uh, don't really care what people think of me when this is done, but God, if they think a lot of you, and they think a lot of the Lord Jesus Christ, then something has been accomplished this morning. I pray that you'd be with anybody that might be here that doesn't know you as their Savior, that you'd help them to see that, that uh, there is a Savior, God, that went to the cross and died on the cross for their sins and is willing to accept anybody that comes to them by repentance and faith. I pray that you'd be with those that might be listening uh, over the Internet or however, uh, whatever medium they're listening in, God, that you might be with them and touch their hearts. Be with us, God, that know you as our Savior, God, that we'd be reminded of things that we need to be doing and be reminding of, of, of the Savior, God, that we need to be um, 
paying attention to. Be with us now, God. God help us, uh, help us, God, to draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's, there's a myriad of things our eyes can see. There's tons of things your eyes can see in the course of a day. Um, the most, most Americans, digital, digital marketing experts estimate that most Americans are exposed to 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements each day. 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements each day. The, the uh, average person gets distracted in eight seconds though. The average person gets distracted in eight seconds. 84% of communication is visual. The human eye can see 60 frames per second. 60 frames per second. So there's lots of stuff that's passing us constantly. Passing us constantly. You know, the Bible has many warnings about what we see. Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Psalm 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. Matthew 5.28 but I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And we're reminded in, Psalm 15, in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Well, today we're going to focus on somebody we should be looking at. Somebody we should be looking at. Go back to your passage in, in Luke chapter 4, and he closed the book. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on them, were fastened on him. We should, the, the gist of the message of today is fastening your eyes on Jesus. Fastening your eyes on Jesus. We should be looking at Jesus every day. We should be looking at him in different parts of our lives. If you're here and you're not saved, you need to look to Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Jesus paid the ultimate price. Jesus did everything. All you have to do is look at your sin and say, God, I'm a sinner. I can't, I need to turn from that sin and turn to Jesus. But we need to look at Jesus. You know, there's so many times we don't look at Jesus. We don't look at him. I've, I've uh, years ago, I was with people that were witnessing to people and telling people how to be saved, and not one time did the word Jesus come out of their mouth. Well, what's Christianity about? Christianity is about Jesus Christ. And so many times we forget that. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and what he did for us. We should focus on Jesus. Um, George Mueller said this, there were few people perhaps more passionately fond of traveling and seeing fresh places and new scenes than myself. But now, since the grace of God, I have seen beauty in the Lord Jesus, I've lost my taste for those things. I've lost my taste for those things. He said, Jesus is more important than seeing things. Now, is you wrong if you go and see the Grand Canyon? No, but Jesus is more important than that. And, uh, and we need to remember that. We need to remember that. And I'm trying to figure out where the high speed on this fan is. Uh, there we go. There's a fan behind the pulpit for good reason. For good reason. And um, believe me, it's a little bit warmer up here. But that's okay. So what should the results be if we fasten on Jesus? The first thing is, if our eyes are fastened on him, we'll hear what he has to say. That seems kind of crazy, but we'll, it seems like, a, you know, what do they say? Like, duh, of course. But if our eyes are fastened on him, we'll hear what he has to say. You know, if you're looking at somebody, and we all have to work on this sometime, when you're looking at somebody, you'll listen to them better. If, if, you look, if somebody's talking to you and you're looking over here, then you're not listening. You're not listening. Um, years ago, I worked for 84 Lumber, and they, they, at the time they were hiring a whole bunch of people, and, and uh, we would try to guess who the area manager would hire if somebody walked in. And you'd see a guy walk in dressed kind of plain, and, or a guy walk in with a three-piece suit and uh, a resume, the whole business. And I'd say to the area manager, did you hire him? Nope. Why not? Because he wouldn't look me in the eye. If he won't look me in the eye, I don't care if he can walk on water. I'm not hiring him. 
And there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. Well, we should look at Jesus and uh, hear what he has to say. And they did listen to him. Go back to your passage in Luke chapter 4, verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And, a bit, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? The scripture that he read was a scripture about the Messiah. And he was basically saying, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. And uh, I said, wait a minute. You're Joseph's son. But... Um, and I'll bear him witness and wonder, is not this Joseph son? Verse 23. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also in thy country. They wanted him to do miracles. Because if you read some of the other, there's a parallel passage in John and in Matthew before this where Jesus healed a whole bunch of people. And so the people in his hometown said, Wait a minute, you should be doing miracles here. You should be doing miracles here. But, uh, in verse 24, and he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Serapita, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, were, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill where the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with, with power. His word was, was with power. They were upset with him because he said, you guys want me to perform a miracle here. But he said in the Old Testament, um, the, uh, he's talking about Naaman, the Syrian, which was a Gentile, being healed. He's talking about the widow woman who was a Gentile. He went to him, and so they're saying, wait a minute, we're Jews, and he's talking about helping out the Gentiles. Well, he's kind of telling them, listen, guys, I'm here for everybody. And... Um, they just didn't get the message yet. But we need to listen to what Jesus says. We need to listen. You know, every time we open the Bible, we should look for Jesus. We should look for Jesus. He's there. He's there. We should look for him, and we should learn, and we should look for what we can learn from him. We can learn from him. He's in the pages of the Bible. James 1 talks about hearing and doing. Hearing and doing. We need to listen to Jesus and do what he says instead of listening to the philosophy of the world. We're, um, we're inundated with the philosophy of the world. And the more we listen to Jesus and talk to him, the more we're going to know him. How do you get to know people? You get to know people by talking to them. You get to know people by spending time with them. And part of our problem, part of my problem sometime, it, sometimes is we don't spend enough time with Jesus. And then we say, I want to know Jesus. Well, if you want to know Jesus, you need to spend time with him. You need to open the Bible and see what the Bible says to him, says about him. The Old Testament talks about Jesus. The New Testament talks about Jesus. The Pauline epistles talk about Jesus. And we need to listen to what he says. So the first thing we should do when we have our eyes fastened on him is listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. You know, the Bible's a powerful book. The Bible has many things that will help us in our lives. And the Bible has the perfect example in Jesus. And if we listen to him and pay time and spend time with him, we'll get to know him more. The second thing, the second result of our eyes being fastened on him, it will keep us from sin. We won't want to disappoint him. We won't want to disappoint him. Proverbs 15.3 says, we already read this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 20.28 20, says, A king that sitteth on the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil, 
with his eyes, all evil with his eyes. If we picture Jesus looking at us, we'll be afraid we won't want to sin. You know, my father, one of my neighbors, referred to my father as a stern man. I guess that was one way of putting it. My father was a strict disciplinarian. But looking back, I loved him for it. But he would scatter away evil with his eyes. I mean, he would give you the look. And uh, if you got the look, you knew you were in trouble. But sometimes the look meant you were going to get disciplined. But sometimes the look was a look of disappointment. You know better than that. He didn't have to say anything. I'd want to crawl under a rock because I disappointed him. How much more should it be when we disappoint our Heavenly Father, when we disappoint Jesus? Turn to, uh, um, turn to uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 is the passage where Peter denies Jesus Christ. And if you go down to, uh, look at verse 54. And they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him. This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And a little while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, This fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter, and Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered. We'll stop there. Peter remembered. The Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine that look? It says, no wonder Peter went out and wept bitterly. Uh, the look of disappointment. The look of disappointment. If our eyes are fastened on Jesus, we won't want to disappoint him. We disappoint him. We fall into sin when our eyes are off Jesus. When we, we think, oh, I could just casually walk through life and not think about the consequences of my actions. I used to go to college with some kids that, I'm not looking back, I'm not even sure they were saved. They'd say, oh, I can do wrong because all I have to do is confess it. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what about disappointing Jesus? What about not living up? He died on the cross for us. And when we sin, we're so casual about it. Turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12. I noticed this. You know, one thing, one thing we need to do, we need to realize as we, we read the Bible and look for Jesus, you know, we need to keep looking. You know, sometimes, I've been reading my Bible for 50 to 60 years, and there are some things in my Bible that I've just seen in the last six months because I kept reading. Well, we need to keep looking. But 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12, um, oh, 1 Samuel. No, this is not it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on a second. How about 2 Samuel 12? 2 Samuel 12. Second Samuel 12 and verse 7. This is after David sinned with Bathsheba. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of Saul's hand, and gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? to do evil in his sight. I never noticed that before. Wherefore have you despised the commandment of the Lord? When we sin, we despise the commandment of the Lord. But look at verse 10. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and taken Uriah the Hittite, the Hittite to be thy wife. When we sin, we despise God. 
Uh, ouch, ouch. I need to think about that the next time I sin, that I'm despising God. If our eyes are on the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll keep us from sin. It'll keep us from despising God. Despising God. You say, well, that's hard. Yes, it is hard. Yes, it is hard. And I don't like to read that. Uh, I don't like to hear that, but that's what it is. When you're sinning, you're despising God. So if our eyes are on the Lord, it'll keep us from sin. And if our eyes are fastened on him, we won't be looking at the attractions of the world. Go in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. The affections of the world won't be what they should be. If our eyes are on him. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If ye be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then you shall appear with him in glory. Mortify, kill, in other words, therefore your members upon the earth. And he lists... Um, List some sin there. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. In verse 11. It says, For the God of grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the, great, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, I could leave right now, uh, but, but uh, because of that, because of that, we should despise, not despise God, we should despise sin in our lives. We should despise sin in our lives. If we look at him, we won't be sinning. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. You know, I've, I've read enmity a million times and never looked it up to see what it meant. Enmity means the state of being actively opposed or hostile to someone. So if we're a friend of the world, we're hostile to God. We're hostile to God. Um, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend to the world is the enemy, the enemy of God. Um, if we keep our eyes fastened on Jesus, the attractions of the world won't mean so much to us. There's so many attractions out there today. There's so many things in front of you today. Uh, when I was a kid, you had to work a little harder to sin than you do now. You don't have to work very hard to see bad stuff today. Not very hard at all. I pray. I do. I pray for everybody in this church every day. I pray for the teenagers. I pray for the young men. I pray that they won't see stuff that they shouldn't see because the attractions of the world are out there. Because I know what this 67-year-old guy wants to look at. The attractions of the world. And so... We don't, if when we get away from God and our eyes aren't on him, that's when we become an enemy of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, The world passes away, and the lusts thereof. But whosoever doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, Lot's wife couldn't take her eyes off the world, and it destroyed her. It destroyed her. She became a pillar of salt. You know, the world doesn't last, but a relationship with Jesus lasts. A relationship with Jesus lasts. Uh, go to Psalms, Psalms 27. Psalm 27 and verse 4. Psalm 27 and verse 4. The, the psalm starts out, The Lord of the, is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? But one thing, where verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When we picture in our minds who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us, it will help keep us from sin. It will keep our eyes focused on him. Our eyes focused 
on him. You know, uh, Pastor Carpenter is beholding the beauty of the Lord in his temple. Wish it was me. I wish it was me. I mean, I don't have a death wish or anything, but, uh, <laughs> we, but I can guarantee you one thing. 30 years from now, I'm going to be there because I don't think I'm going to live to be 97. So, uh, but anyway, um, behold, if we keep that in our mind, we'll know that. Moving right along here, if our eyes are fastened on him, we'll see his compassion. We'll see his compassion. Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. If our eyes are fastened on Jesus, we'll be compassionate like he is compassionate. You know, we think about, there's a lot of people in this world I don't like. Uh, uh, I don't like people that are pro-abortion. I don't like them. Our new governor just made a big speech about how that's she's going to be one of the hallmarks of her governorship. She wants to... She had a speech at Planned Parenthood yesterday, and she wants to push the abortion push across the country. Well, I hope she fails. I don't like her, but I don't want her to go to hell. I don't want her to go to a place where she's never going to get out. I don't want that. I should have compassion on that. I don't have compassion on one abortion doctor in the country. I don't. But they need to be saved. They need to be saved. And we need to remember that. When he says, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. You know, there was a lot of bad people in Jerusalem. You had Pharisees and Sadducees and all the people that hated Jesus. But what did Jesus say? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest all those that come unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee together as a mother hen her chickens, but ye would not. He had compassion on them, even though they hated him. They hated him. We should, have, if we have our eyes fastened on Jesus, we'll have compassion on the world. We'll have compassion on the world. And how do we do that? Verse 38. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We need to pray for that every day. Every day. By the way, I've got a little secret I'm going to tell you teenagers. I'm praying that every one of you will be called into full-time Christian service. Every one of you. And you say, I'm just praying for you. I'm not telling you have to. You do what God tells you to do. But just let this guy pray for you, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm, every one of them, every kid. Is this, you know, if I had to do my life over again, and God didn't want me to do that, so I didn't do that. But you know what? A hundred years from now, is it going to matter how many yards of concrete I sent out? Nope, not a bit. Is it going to matter? But it's going to matter if I had an influence on somebody. It's going to matter if I led somebody to the Lord, if I was an example to somebody. That's what's going to matter. And I'm not saying... It doesn't matter that people, you know, we, this church couldn't survive if nobody had a job. I realize that. <laughs> you know, everybody has their own place. Everybody has their own calling. I understand that. I'm just saying, let me rephrase this. No, I'm not going to rephrase this. I'm praying that every young people person in this church will be called into full-time Christian service or at least give God that opportunity don't slam the door on it. Say to God, listen, it's all yours. It's all yours. You do with me what you want. You do with me what you want.
But that's compassion, the compassion we should have on the world, compassion we should have for our neighbors. I haven't always had perfect neighbors. I haven't. I've got a neighbor now that could be the remake of Sanford and Son. Um, uh, <laughs> he really, believe me, he could. But I still need to have compassion on him. This summer, I went over to see him, and he was, had family problems. I told him, I said, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need. He didn't want to listen to me, but um, he doesn't talk to me. His dogs do, but he doesn't. He does. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, uh, but we should still have compassion on people. You know what? We get so caught up with day-to-day -day life. I'm sure some of you work with people that are jerks, okay, to be frank. There's lots of jerks to go around. There is no shortage of jerks in this world. There really isn't. There's plenty. But you know what? You're saved. If you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. 50 years from now, they could, call, you know, they could call you anything today. They could be mean to you today. They could be mean to me today. They could treat me wrong today. 50 years from now, I'm going to be in the presence of God. Where are they going to be if they don't get saved? Where are they going to be? And sometimes, and I have been there, I've come home from work and complained to my wife. I said, well, I can feel like choking that guy. He's just giving me a hard time. Well, where is he going to be 50 years from now? When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because there was a sheep having no shepherd. You know, in 1 Peter it says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. He reviled not again. You want somebody to spit in your face? Somebody spits in my face, I'm going to punch them in their face. <laughs> That's a natural reaction. Do you ever think about that? Jesus sat there and watched them pull his beard, spit in his face, tell him that you're the son of an illegitimate marriage and the whole business, when he could have sent them to 15 solar systems down the road. Could have. So if our eyes are fixed on him, we'll be compassionate. We'll be compassionate. Touch something on there. It sounds electronic. I don't think there's anything in there. Maybe it's going to blow up. I don't know. That'd be OK. Uh, if our eyes are fixed on him, we'll see his pierced hands and feet. We'll remember that Christ died for us. We'll remember that he died for our sins. You know, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to look to Jesus on the cross. The Bible says the gospel is Christ died for our sins. You ever think about that? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for me. He died for you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got a God that died for you. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, anything that takes away from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is a lie of the devil. Is a lie of the devil. You know, if you think your church, your sacrament, anything you can do can get you to heaven. But repentance and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, you're wrong. Because the Bible preaches grace all through the New Testament, all through the Gospels. Grace. And I'll never figure that out. I'll never figure out how a God in heaven could choose to forgive me. Choose to forgive me. Never forget when I was a little kid. Remember saying, how can he forgive me? I know what a wretch I am. I know what a wretch I am, and he can forgive me? And if you're here and, and you don't know where to turn, and you don't know where you're going when you die, we're going to have an invitation at the end of the service. If you come forward, we'll put you with somebody that can help you explain that to you more thoroughly. But Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins, and if 
our eyes are fixed on him. We're going to remember that. And we're going to realize that. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 2.9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For every man. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, but quickened by the Spirit, but quickened by the Spirit. We need, Jesus Christ died on the cross, for our sins. So many times we forget that. We forget, Christ died for me. He died for me, and that should be our message to our community. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. You couldn't save yourself. Money can't save you. Nothing can save you, but Jesus can. Jesus can save you. We need to remember that. If our eyes are fastened on Jesus, life's problems won't seem so important. Life's problems won't seem so important. We'll remember how much he cares for us. John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go for, to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where you may be also. If our eyes are fixed on him, we'll remember how much he cares for us. We'll remember that the things around of this earth shouldn't be so important. He says, I will come again. That's just as much a promise as for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And one of these days, he's going to come again. And let's... I hope it's soon. I hope it's soon. I pray that it's soon. Um, when I was a little kid, we used to have a, we used to have a, uh, a stand where we used to put our milk cans on. I mean, it's that long ago. And the guy would come up and we'd wheel the milk cans into the truck. Well, when I first learned about the rapture, as a little kid, I used to jump off the thing, hoping that the rapture would happen before I hit the ground. <laughs> but, I mean, I was a little kid. I'm ha if, I knew, if I thought it would work, I'd jump off this altar, but then you'd have to pick me up and take me down to the emergency room. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm not suggesting we go up on the building. And, uh, but he said, I will, I will come again. John 16, says, These things have I spoken unto you that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. You know how many times Jesus said that to his disciples? When they're rowing across the thing and Peter's walking water, he says, be of good cheer. What are you guys worried about? I'm here. What are you worried about? That's why we should be walking around saying to ourselves and everybody else, be of good cheer. You know, this is a crazy, crazy world we're living in. I mean, I don't know how to say this word right. Things have exponentially, I don't know if I'm saying it right, moved in a bad direction in the last few years. Uh, that means fast, I think. But, but, we, but we should, you know what? Be of good cheer. We should be of good cheer. If our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we're going to be of good cheer. Because, think about it. What's the worst that can happen to you? Worst that could happen to you is somebody beats you up and you die or something like that. But if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. So what's the big deal? I mean, really. We get so caught up with the things, with the problems of our daily life that we forget to focus on what's important. I'm talking to me. Uh, we get caught up with that. And we think, oh, man, we got a real problem here. You know, well, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. And uh, because if we have Jesus, 
we should be of good cheer. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have a lot to be happy about because you don't have a savior. Your eternal destiny is not secure. But if you have Jesus, it says, be of good cheer. Second Thessalonians 2, 16 to 19, 16 to 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good work. If our eyes are fastened on him, we'll see how he handled things. For he see how he handled things. First Peter chapter 2, for even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but commanded himself unto him that judgeth righteously. Um, you know, you look at the example of Jesus. If our eyes are fixed on him, we'll see how he handled things. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took himself of no, or made himself of no reputation. It took upon him the, the form of a servant. And being found in the fashion as a man, and I may not be quoting it exactly right, um, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But what's the first part of that chapter say? Let this mind be in you, in Christ Jesus, who made himself a servant. What did John do to the disciples before the cross? He got on his knees and he washed their feet. He's the Lord of the universe and he's washing their feet. We should learn from his example. If our eyes are fixed on him, we're going to try to be like him, be like him. If we fasten our eyes on him, we won't be able to turn away. We won't be able to turn away. You know, we, we think of going to heaven and seeing all the golden streets and all those things. I don't know. For a few thousand years, I want to look at Jesus. I want to look at Jesus. Um, there's something about looking at somebody's face. And you know, there's people that I've have lost over the years that I, can, I, I, would lo I want to see them again. But you know what, I want to see Jesus more. I want to see Jesus more. You know, in Isaiah 34, verse 17, it says, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Thou shalt behold the land that is very far off. If our eyes are really fixed on Jesus, we won't want to look at anything else. We won't want to look at anything else. We won't want to look at anybody else. That doesn't mean you can't have friends, you can't have family. You know what I mean. Our focus should be on the Lord. Because if it is, then all this stuff, this stuff, that we deal with in this life won't be as important as we think they are. It won't be. If you're, you know, if you're lost, you need to fasten your eyes on Jesus, not your works, not anything else. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Try to find Jesus in the Bible. Seek to stay away from sin. How much has the world got you? How much has the world got you? How much compassion do you have? Remember what he's done for you. Maybe you just need to rededicate yourself to having a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and paying attention to Jesus and who he is and what he's done. Learn it from his example. If you're lost, you need to come to Jesus Christ. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Why don't we stand to our feet? And uh, we'll have a word of prayer. We'll have an invitation. Uh, I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed. If uh, we're going to play an invitation song here in a few minutes. If uh, you're lost or if, if you say, what is that crazy guy? What's he talking about? And you want to know more, come forward. 
I'll meet you here. And uh, we'll have somebody show you in the Bible what it means to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved and you want to come forward to pray, you do that. But let's, uh, let's focus and turn our eyes, turn our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings. God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for your word. God, help us to always remember the Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us to remember, God, what you've done for us. Help us, God, to fasten our eyes upon you. I pray, God, if there's someone here, God, that doesn't understand, God, that you'd help them to come to an understanding of what salvation is. God, help the rest of us, God, that are saved to rededicate ourselves, God, to having our focus on Jesus and not the world around us, having our focus on you, God, and what we can learn from you and the example that we can follow. Father, be with us now in this invitation. Speak to our hearts, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.